Welcome back to The Book of Mormon, a masterclass. My name is John Hilton. As the time gets closer to the Savior's second coming, would you like to know what to expect prior to his return? If the Lord were to give you a document that would help you know what types of things would happen, would you want to read it? He has. Check out this book I recently found. It's available on Amazon. It's called Undeniable Biblical Proof. Jesus Christ will return to planet Earth exactly 2,000 years after the year of his death. What you must do to be ready. Now, I'm not making up that that book exists on Amazon, but I am kidding. That's not the book I'm recommending to learn about the signs of the second coming. It's actually the Book of Mormon, also available on Amazon, and the Kindle version is free. Why study the Book of Mormon to prepare for the second coming? Consider this important quote from President Ezra Taft Benson. He said, The record of the Nephite history just prior to the Savior's visit reveals many parallels to our own day as we anticipate the Savior's second coming. So today, as we explore 3 Nephi chapters 1-7, through 7, we want to keep our eye both on knowing what's happening amongst the Nephites and also looking for parallels that might be present in our day. First, I want to share an insight that I learned as I was sitting in the classroom of Dr. Jan Martin, a religion professor at Brigham Young University. Note that at the beginning of 3rd Nephi, there were some who began to say that the time was past for the words to be fulfilled, which were spoken by Samuel the Lamanite. As you recall, Samuel had said that in five years, there would be a day, a night, and a day without any darkness. Now, you and I know how this story is going to end, but imagine you didn't. Imagine you were a believer at the start of 3rd Nephi. Imagine that every night you watched the sun set and you thought, maybe this is going to be the night where it stays light. And everyone is making fun of you, saying Samuel is a false prophet. Things get even more intense when you learn that there was a day set apart by the unbelievers that all those who believed in those traditions should be put to death except the sign should come to pass, which had been given by Samuel the prophet. Note that all those who believed were going to be put to death. Now, here's the insight that I hadn't noticed before. Back in Alma chapter 30, this is about 75 years before 35 chapter 1, we read, There was no law against a person's belief. For it was strictly contrary to the commands of God that there should be a law which should bring people onto unequal grounds. There was a law that people should be judged according to their crimes. Nevertheless, there was no law against a person's belief. Can you see how something has changed in these intervening 75 years? We've gone from no law against a person's belief to those who believed would be put to death. In other words, we've seen a significant erosion of religious freedom. This clearly has parallels in our time. What is religious freedom? One definition states, freedom of religion is a fundamental human right that protects the conscience of all people. It allows us to think, express, and act upon what we deeply believe. Elder Ronald A. Rasban taught, There is a scourge sweeping the globe, attacks on your and my religious freedom. This growing sentiment seeks to remove religion and faith in God from the public square, schools, community standards, and civic discourse. Opponents of religious freedom seek to impose restrictions on expressions of heartfelt convictions. They even criticize and ridicule faith traditions. Such an attitude marginalizes people, devaluing personal principles, fairness, respect, spirituality, and peace of conscience. Consider a few examples of how religious freedom is under attack today. In one case, a woman named Samantha, a 17-year-old Muslim, was denied a job at Abercrombie & Fitch because of her headscarf. The Supreme Court ruled that employers must consider religious needs in hiring decisions, 
protecting religious diversity in the workplace. In another case, an Orthodox Jewish advocacy group sued New York Governor Andrew Cuomo for his discriminatory cluster action initiative. Ostensibly a measure to target COVID-19, a federal judge found that Cuomo's plan was intended to target the Orthodox Jewish community. The United States Court of Appeals ruled 3-0 to zero against Cuomo, halting his caps on religious worship while the case is pending. A similar case in California concerning a Pentecostal church led to the California Supreme Court ruling that California had to protect religious liberty and the right to worship. Another case, Mike and Kitty Burke, a Catholic couple from Massachusetts, were denied a foster care license because they said they would continue to hold to their religious beliefs about gender and sexuality. Massachusetts has put vulnerable children into hospital rooms and office spaces because it lacks enough foster families, but is denying some potential foster families because of their religious beliefs. One final example. The Sisters of Life, a Catholic religious community dedicated to protecting the sanctity of human life, faced legal challenges from the state of New York which passed a law targeting pro-life pregnancy centers, including the sisters, by probing their internal documents and policies. The sisters filed a lawsuit to protect their religious freedom and ability to serve vulnerable women without fear of government interference, wanting to protect their duty to help women who need it most. Two months later, the state of New York agreed to a court order that forbids them from demanding the sisters' information or punishing the sisters for refusing to provide it. Note that these cases involve Muslims, Jews, Pentecostals, Catholics. Religious freedom is under attack. This was an important issue amongst the Nephites leading up to the coming of Christ, and it's the same for us today. Around the world, we need to take action to defend religious liberty. So what can we do? Elder Quentin L. Cook said, extraordinary effort will be required to protect religious liberty. My challenge today is that you join with people of all faiths who feel accountable to God in defending religious freedom, so it can be a beacon for morality. We caution you to be civil and responsible as you defend religious liberty and moral values. We ask that you do this on the internet and in your personal interactions in the neighborhoods and communities where you live. Be an active participant, not a silent observer. To be an advocate for religious freedom is to serve mankind and follow the teachings of Jesus Christ. Now, as we go back to 3 Nephi, imagine how Nephi felt. Remember, this is Nephi, the son of Nephi, the son of Helaman, the son of Helaman, the son of Alma, the son of Alma. We talked about this back in Mosiah. It's kind of fun to go through that little family tree. But remember, this whole line of prophets and record keepers came because Abinadi had the courage to teach and Alma had the courage to take a stand. One person truly can affect generations. So Nephi, the son of Helaman, was in charge of the church. That's the Nephi that was all through the end of Helaman. But at the beginning of 3 Nephi 1, this Nephi mysteriously disappears. So now Nephi, the son of Nephi, is in charge of all the sacred records. And there's a day set apart that all those who believe in Samuel's sign will be put to death. Can you imagine how Nephi felt? He's in a terrible situation. His heart is extremely sorrowful. What does he do? He went out and bowed himself down upon the earth and cried mightily to his God in behalf of his people. He cried mightily unto the Lord all that day. And behold, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, Lift up your head and be of good cheer. For behold, the time is at hand, and on this night the sign will be given. Earlier in this course, we've talked about the idea of praying like a prophet. There are so many patterns that we can see in how prophets pray in the Book of Mormon. Like other prophets, Nephi bows himself to the earth. Prayer posture is important. He cries mightily to the Lord. This praying vocally, the intensity of his prayer, set an example for each of us. As Nephi's prayer is answered, 
Notice what the Lord says. On the morrow come I into the world to show unto the world that I will fulfill all that which I have caused to be spoken by the mouth of my holy prophets. We'll see this more in a future class, but I want to point out for now the emphasis that Jesus Christ is placing on prophets. He cares about fulfilling their words. We then read, At the going down of the sun there was no darkness, and the people began to be astonished, because there was no darkness when the night came. And there were many who had not believed in the words of the prophets, who fell to the earth and became as if they were dead. And it had come to pass, yea, all things, every wit, every little detail, according to the words of the prophets. This is another parallel we can anticipate in our day. Some will reject the words of the prophets, but you and I can be confident in prophetic teachings. Now, if we step back, we can see this as a beautiful addition to the nativity story that we recount each year. At Christmas, we often remember Luke 2 and Matthew 2. Perhaps we can also remember 3 Nephi 1 and let the lessons of mighty prayer and following prophets be a part of our Christmas experience. Well, for a brief time, people believed in the prophets and there was peace in the land. But soon the Gadian robbers increased in their numbers, and even the rising generation of Lamanites began to turn towards wickedness. In 35 chapter 2, it gets to the point where there are so many wars with the Gadian robbers that all of the righteous Nephites and all of the righteous Lamanites join together. So it's no longer Lamanites versus Nephites, it's all the Nephites and Lamanites combined versus the Gadianton robbers. And this takes us to one of the most interesting letters in the Book of Mormon. By now it's been 16 years since Christ was born, and the governor of the combined Nephites and Lamanites is named Laconius. He received a long letter from Gideonhi, the leader of the Gadianton robbers. Let's look at some excerpts from this letter. Gideonhi wrote, Laconius, most noble and chief governor of the land. Behold, I write this epistle unto you, and do give unto you exceedingly great praise because of your firmness, and also the firmness of your people, in maintaining that which ye suppose to be your right and liberty. Yea, ye do stand well as if ye were supported by the hand of a God in the defense of your liberty. I have written this epistle, sealing it with my own hand, feeling for your welfare, because of your firmness and that which ye believe to be right, and your noble spirit in the field of battle. I write unto you, desiring that ye would yield up unto this my people, your cities, your lands, and your possessions, rather than that they should visit you with the sword, and that destruction should come upon you. Gideonhi is so sugary sweet. It makes me sick. He pretends to care about Laconius and his people. He's kind of buttering him up. But of course, he doesn't mean it. Gideonhi says, yield yourselves up unto us, unite with us, and become acquainted with our secret works, and become our brethren, that you may be like unto us, not our slaves, but our partners of all our substance. This is another example of Satan's blatant lies. Gadian robbers exist by stealing stuff. So if the Nephites and Lamanites join with Gadian robbers, how is this all going to work that they're going to share the stuff that they're stealing from each other? Now, note his conclusion. I am Gideon High, and I am the governor of this, the secret society of Gadianton. Now, I think that's kind of funny because I guess it's not so secret anymore. But Gideon High goes on to brag about how this society and the works thereof I know to be good. They are of an ancient date. And I write this epistle unto you, Laconius, and I hope that you will deliver up your lands and your possessions, that my people may recover their rights and government who have dissented away from you because of your wickedness in retaining from them their rights of government. And except ye do this, I will avenge their wrongs. There's something in Gideonhi's words that we've seen before. 
Do you remember back when we were in Mosiah 10? We read the Lamanites believed in the traditions of their fathers, that they were wronged in the wilderness by their brethren, and they were also wronged while crossing the sea. Can you see how there was a false narrative going on in Mosiah chapter 10? We know that that's not the true story. In another letter, back in the war chapters, Amaron wrote Moroni saying, I am Amaron and a descendant of Zoram, whom your fathers pressed and brought out of Jerusalem. We talked about how in 2 Nephi 5, Zoram chose to go with Nephi and his family. So there's clearly something wrong with the story Amaron is telling himself. Gideonhi, Amaron, those Lamanites, they're all involved in self-deception. C. Terry Warner made studying self-deception a key aspect of more than five decades of study. Together with a team of researchers, he concluded that self-deception often begins when we feel a pull to do something good, but then we choose not to do that thing, setting up an experience in which we feel a need to justify ourselves. To help us understand this a little better, let's think about a modern story told by Warner. Marty was lying in bed, wrapped in the comfort of a deep sleep. He was a young, ambitious businessman, concerned about his career ladder and preoccupied most of the time with corporate assignments. As he slept, his four-month-old baby began to cry in the nursery. Marty roused, lifted his head, and looked at the clock. 2.30. His wife, Carolyn, lying next to him in her curlers and sleeping mask, wasn't stirring. Marty told this story. At that moment, I had a fleeting feeling, a feeling that if I got up quickly, I might be able to see what was wrong before my wife would have to wake up. I don't think it was even a thought because it went too fast for me to say it out in my mind. It was a feeling that this was something I really ought to do but I didn't do it. I didn't go right back to sleep either. It bugged me that my wife wasn't waking up. I kept thinking it was her job. She has her work and I have mine. Mine starts early. She can sleep in. Besides, I was exhausted. Besides, I never really know how to handle the baby. Maybe she was lying there waiting for me to get up. Why did I have to feel guilty when I'm only trying to get some sleep so I can do well on the job? She was the one who wanted to have this kid in the first place. At the moment Marty felt he should get up with the baby, he didn't have any angry feelings towards his wife. But the moment he chose not to follow this impression, he had a new need, a need to be justified in his choice to not do something he felt he should do, leading to this self-deception. Perhaps Marty chose to remain in bed waiting for Carolyn to wake up. As he did so, his newfound belief that her actions were indicating her disrespect for his hard work would start just eating away at him. Or maybe Marty chooses to go help the baby and congratulates himself on like, wow, I'm such a caring person. I'm always thinking of others, unlike Carolyn. Either way, Marty turns himself into a martyr figure with Carolyn as the villain. Although this example of self-deception is relatively small, Over time, it could become the cause of deep disappointment and heartache in Marty and Carolyn's marriage. It could easily lead to him subconsciously or consciously treating Carolyn with less kindness than he should, perhaps causing her to reciprocate and leading to a downward spiral. Can you see how Gideonhi, Amaron, and this later group of Lamanites who had inherited unrighteous traditions were in a similar state of self-deception. It's so easy for us to take any given circumstance that we're in and then invent a surrounding storyline about it and feel justified in our self-deception. In essence, and this is true for each of us, we experience an event And then we tell ourselves a story about that event, which leads to feelings and actions about what is taking place. Here, Marty witnessed an event, the baby crying, Carolyn didn't wake up. He told himself a story. My wife is so inconsiderate. 
which led to his feelings of resentment. He could have told himself a different story. My wife works so hard. It's really difficult to care for a baby. I haven't been helping as much as I promised I would. And then he would have had a completely different experience. Consider another example of how one person experienced an event and then quickly told himself a false story. Aaron was participating in a study abroad program and living with a hundred other college students about his same age. Aaron got along with most of the students, but there was one student, Chris, who Aaron and nearly everybody else on the study abroad program found to be annoying. One day, Aaron was enjoying a quiet lunch when he noticed Chris was looking for a place to sit. There was an empty spot next to Aaron, and for a split second, he felt like he should offer his seat to Chris. But he decided not to do it. A few moments later, Chris came up to Aaron and asked if he could sit by him. To be polite, Aaron agreed, but inside he felt extremely resentful. Chris has ruined my peaceful lunch, he said to himself. In this case, Aaron had a feeling to do something kind towards Chris. He didn't follow that inner feeling and, as a result, felt resentful toward Chris when Chris asked to sit by him. Had Aaron followed through on the kind idea that he had, he would have likely had a much happier feeling. In other words, it wasn't the situation itself that ruined Aaron's lunch, but rather his lack of acting on the feelings that he had had to do good that ruined the lunch. But without even realizing it, Aaron has shifted the blame to Chris. Now, if you're interested in exploring ideas around self-deception, I highly recommend the books Bonds That Make Us Free, Leadership and Self-Deception, and The Anatomy of Peace. I think that if Gideon High would have read these books, he would have come to understand that he has told himself a completely false narrative. He's telling himself that he and his people have been wronged, but they have wronged themselves. Now, we could spend hours on this topic, but to be brief, in order to break free from any self-deception that you or I might have, here are five key steps that we can follow. First, we can recognize false stories. Until we see that we are deceiving ourselves, we won't be likely to go much further. Second, we can probe for alternative stories that may provide additional perspective on what really is taking place. Third, we can stop and really look at the person we're in conflict with. This often leads to feelings of love helping us to see more clearly. Fourth, we can revisit the situation with new perspectives. This will often give us promptings of new things we can do. So fifth, that takes us back to having a choice. Do we act on what we feel is the right thing to do? Now, We've spent a lot of time on this already, but if it's okay, I want to share with you a personal story to illustrate these points. And I want to say up front, I'm not proud of this story, but I hope it can be instructive. Before my wife, Lonnie, and I graduated from college, we each spoke a little bit of Spanish, but neither of us had served Spanish-speaking missions. We hadn't developed deep levels of Spanish fluency and during our courtship, we thought it would be great to spend a summer in Mexico, fully immersed in the Spanish language. To make a long story short, all these miraculous doors opened up for us, and six weeks after Lonnie and I were married, we flew to Tampico, Mexico, where we worked on course development for a private university. It was an amazing opportunity to begin our married life with a unique international experience. We lived with a widow named Irma. She provided almost all of our meals, and she spoke very little English, which forced us to use Spanish with her. In the spirit of the Speak Your Language program at the MTC, Lonnie and I only spoke Spanish to each other in this uh, six-week period. And this led to some mistakes, such as the time I said, no te olvides la llave, which is don't forget the key. And she thought I said, yo tengo la llave, meaning I have the key. So that led to our being locked out of our house for several hours. In retrospect, maybe it's best for newlyweds to speak the language that they both know rather than one they don't. But we loved living in Tampico. We spent time downtown, attended the temple, went to the beach. We saw a Disney movie in Spanish. It was magical. Now, 
Prior to arriving in Tampico, we set a strict budget for ourselves for how much money we would spend. We wanted to save for a down payment on a house. Now I say we set a budget, but really it was me that set a budget. So I said, this is like the money we have for our 10 weeks in Mexico. And Lonnie was in charge of how it would be spent. Well, I noticed that we were starting to spend more and more money. And frequently I would warn Lonnie, hey, we're kind of getting low on our money. Be careful. We don't want to go over budget. Well, Lonnie told our coworkers that while we were in Mexico, we wanted to see some ancient ruins. From the outset, though, I was really nervous about the idea of going to see ancient ruins because obviously it was going to be very expensive. And as it turned out, there was not enough money in the budget to make the overnight trip to see the ancient ruins, even though our coworkers were going to be providing us with free transportation. Lonnie felt like the budget we had created was arbitrary. And honestly, that was true. And honestly, we actually did have enough money in the bank to go and do some of these things. So she felt like we should take the chance to visit these ancient ruins. After all, she said, this might be the only opportunity we get to do it. Now, I understood Lonnie's enthusiasm, but I really feel like, no, you got to stick to your budget. I can clearly picture a July day in which Lonnie and I were returning to work from lunch. We were near the end of our 20-minute walk, and both of us were hot and tired. We were arguing for what seemed like the hundredth time about the trip to the ruins. My perspective was, look, if we can't stay within a budget for two months, we'll never be able to have a budget. I was so worried, like, look, we're, we're creating a foundation of financial ruin. Lonnie said, look, we should just add some money to the budget we set. The original amount you set, John, wasn't very realistic. This is a great opportunity. Let's go and have fun. And I was like, that's not how budgets work. You can't just add money to go have fun. That's not a budget. So you can tell, like, I really had these strong feelings about it. Lonnie was upset. She turned away from me, walked into the office, and I spent a lot of that afternoon kind of stewing around, thinking to myself, why do I have a wife who doesn't understand the value of budgeting? Later that day, I kind of went in and locked myself in the bathroom, and I was just kind of pouring my heart out in prayer. And I was thinking to myself, look, I've either made a really bad choice in marrying Lonnie, or else this is like a huge trial that I'm going to have for the rest of my life of always being arguing about budgets. And as I was reflecting on kind of the situation and the words that I had just prayed, I felt this message from the Lord come into my heart. No, John, the problem is not with Lonnie. The problem is with you. And I was like, well, how can that be? Like, she's the one who wants to change the budget. It's she's the one who's being unreasonable. And it was like the Lord said to me, no, you're the one who needs to change. It's not that Lonnie's going crazy. You're the one who's going crazy over this arbitrary budget that you made. You're telling yourself a completely false narrative. And the more that I thought about the situation, the more I realized I was in the wrong. I started to cry. I knew that like this was not good. By this time, pretty much everyone else had left the office. So I came out, talked to Lonnie, and I just apologized. I said, I'm in the wrong. She forgave me. We went to the ruins. We loved it. It was our favorite part of our trip to Tampico. Now, I was definitely in the wrong. I hope that you haven't judged me too harshly as I have shared this story. I've tried to repent since then. And in a future class, we're going to talk about not judging. So just remember that. For me, it was this moment of prayer that helped me recognize that I was telling myself a false story. It helped me see that there was another story that could be told. As I later looked at Lonnie, I had this new perspective on her as a person, and that took me back to a choice. It's easy to fall into self-deception. The Lamanites, Amaron, Gideon High all did it. But they're not alone. Even good people can do this. Remember, Chief Captain Moroni jumped to conclusions and told himself a false story about Bahorin. And Nephi told himself a false story when he said, I wish I could have lived in the days of the original Nephi, when everything was so awesome. Any of us can tell ourselves false stories. This area of self-deception is one that I'm continuing to work on in my own life. I hope that thinking about Gideon High's letter in this light can remind us to be careful about the stories we tell ourselves 
and make sure we're seeing things as they really are. We can also learn important lessons from how the people responded to Gideon High. We read, Laconius, the governor, was a just man and could not be frightened by the demands and the threatenings of a robber. Therefore, he did not hearken to the epistle of Gideon High, but he did cause that his people should cry unto the Lord for strength against the time that the robbers should come down against them. Think about some of those powerful phrases. The people did repent of all their sins. They did put up their prayers unto the Lord their God that He would deliver them in the time that their enemies should come down against them to battle. There are so many things that we can learn from Laconius and the people of his time. We can learn valuable lessons to help us in the difficulties we face today. Laconius instructed all the people to gather together and to bring enough food and supplies to last for years. Maybe we can see parallels both in spiritual gatherings, spiritual reserves, as well as having enough food, financial, and other reserves available. Because the people all gathered together, there was no opportunities for the robbers to plunder, and so the robbers made a frontal assault on the Nephites. Notice what happened on the day of the battle. The armies of the Nephites, when they saw the appearance of the army of Gideonhi, all fell to the earth, and did lift their cries to the Lord their God, that He would deliver them out of the hands of their enemies. When the armies of Gideonhi saw this, they began to shout with a loud voice because of their joy, for they supposed that the Nephites had fallen with fear because of the terror of their armies. But in this thing they were disappointed, for the Nephites did not fear them, but they did fear their God and did supplicate Him for protection. Therefore, when the armies of Gideonhi did rush upon them, they were prepared to meet them, yea, in the strength of the Lord they did receive them. Pause for a moment and think about this passage. What phrases resonate to you? Hopefully, you don't have an army attacking you, but there are ways that we can apply this in our lives. Here's one application I see. Do you remember how back in Mosiah, we talked about the trust continuum? If you recall, there's a y-axis where on the bottom, it's do nothing. And at the top, it's cheerfully doing all things that lie in our power. And on the x-axis, on the far left, you've got trusting in yourself. And on the far right, fully trusting in God. So that creates four quadrants in this trust matrix. And theoretically, a person can have success in each one of those four quadrants. The upper left-hand one where you're working hard and not trusting the Lord, that's a stressful place to live. The sweet spot is in the upper right-hand corner where we're doing work, like we're not just sitting around doing nothing, but we're also putting our full trust in God. I think that Laconius's people are in that upper right-hand corner. Notice they're gathering supplies. They're doing everything they can to be prepared. At the same time, they're crying out to God for deliverance. They're putting their full trust in Him. For each one of us, our situations may be a little different. Sometimes we need to do a little more. And sometimes I think we need to do less and just step back and trust that God's got it. I love how with the story of Laconius, his people went forth in the strength of the Lord. You and I can follow their example, having trust in him. After a series of battles, the Gedant robbers were defeated. When that happened, the people cried out saying, Hosanna to the most high God. And they did cry, blessed be the name of the Lord God Almighty, the most high God. And their hearts were swollen with joy unto the gushing out of many tears because of the great goodness of God in delivering them out of the hands of their enemies. And they knew it was because of their repentance and their humility that they had been delivered from an everlasting destruction. I found that the story of Laconius and his people is one of the least well-known stories in the Book of Mormon. But remember the parallels between their time and our time. Think about lessons of gathering, of being prepared, of trusting in the Lord, 
of finding strength in him. What lessons do you see from this account that could help your life today? Now, in 35 chapter 5, Mormon interjects as the narrator, and one of my favorite verses is in verse 13, where Mormon identifies himself. We can use so many different identifiers, but notice what Mormon says. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I have been called of Him to declare His word among His people, that they might have everlasting life. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. Is this a core part of our identity? I love what President Nelson taught. He said, No identifier should displace, replace, or take priority over these three enduring designations child of God, child of the covenant, disciple of Jesus Christ. At the beginning of 3 Nephi 6, we see peace and prosperity among the Nephites. But then in just a few verses, we again see the pride cycle in action. Starting in verse 9, we read, The people had continual peace, but in the twenty and ninth year, there began to be some disputings among the people. Some were lifted up to pride and boastings because of their exceedingly great riches, yea, even unto great persecutions. So we've gone from peace to pride, and we know that massive destruction is coming soon. Mormon tells us the cause of this iniquity of the people was this. Satan had great power unto the stirring up of the people to do all manner of iniquity and to the puffing them up with pride, tempting them to seek for power and authority and riches and the vain things of the world. In addition to the general pride, there's a specific aspect of the Nephite downfall that I want to highlight. Notice these verses. The people began to be distinguished by ranks according to their riches and their chances for learning. Yea, some were ignorant because of their poverty, and others did receive great learning because of their riches. And thus there became a great inequality in all the land insomuch that the church began to be broken up. Yea, insomuch that in the thirtieth year, the church was broken up in all the land, save it were among a few of the Lamanites. I think it's fascinating that it's specifically stated it was in inequality of income, in inequality of educational opportunities that led to the church being broken up. Seriously, take a moment. Let those phrases sink in. Some were ignorant because of their poverty. Others did receive great learning because of their riches. And thus there became a great inequality in all the land in so much. You see the cause and effect between the inequality and the church began to be broken up. Inequality of income and inequality of educational opportunities destroyed the ancient church. In modern revelations, Jesus Christ has frequently emphasized the importance of temporal equality. He has said, It is not given that one man should possess that which is above another. Wherefore, the world lieth in sin. He said, In your temporal things you shall be equal, and this not grudgingly. Otherwise, the abundance of the manifestations of the Spirit shall be withheld. And he has said, If ye are not equal in earthly things, ye cannot be equal in obtaining heavenly things. Faithful followers of Christ might disagree on how to increase the equality of resources, but it should be clear that the outcome of equality is something the Savior wants us to work towards. And this is not just about temporal welfare, it's spiritual. Temporal and spiritual welfare are connected. As Elder Holland taught, true poverty may do more to destroy the human spirit than any other condition except sin itself. It reminds me of a story told by President David O. McKay. He said, As a young missionary, I was distributing pamphlets in a little undesirable district in Scotland. I approached one door, and in answer to the knock, a haggard woman stood before me poorly dressed, with sunken cheeks and unkempt hair. 
As she received the pamphlet I offered, she said in a rather harsh voice, Will this buy me any bread? From that moment, President McKay said, I had a deeper realization that the Church of Christ should be and is interested in the temporal salvation of man. I walked away from the door feeling that that individual was in no position to receive the message of the gospel. She was in need of temporal help. This is a principle that has come up repeatedly in this masterclass because it comes up repeatedly in the Book of Mormon, actually in every book of Scripture. In addition to an inequality of riches, Mormon specifies that an inequality of educational opportunities was a part of the downfall of the church. I'm so inspired by the initiatives the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is making to provide educational opportunities for others. For example, their initiative, Succeed in Schools, has called volunteer teachers who help tutor younger students so they can be prepared for college. A friend of mine recently visited this program in Africa. She and her colleagues shared some inspirational social media posts. They had pictures of large groups of youth gathering to study. Captioning one photo, they wrote, Students have finished their exams and are only a few months into their skills classes, such as hospitality, electrical training, cybersecurity, catering, and computer programming courses. The experience they are gaining will hopefully have a long-term impact for their future. As one student said, after the skills course, I can make something out of my skills. That can never be taken away from me. Another leader from Sierra Leone said, When youth who are members of the church bring their friends to class, their parents cannot believe that a church would provide free classes to help young people learn and provide food. They think it's a miracle. We agree that miracles are happening all over West Africa, they conclude, and it has been a privilege over the past two weeks to witness them. I wish I had had the opportunity to go with them on this journey. Can you sense the inspiration in the leaders of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in helping spread educational opportunities to those who aren't in need. And there's so much more. You've likely heard of BYU Pathway, which is opening up doors for tens of thousands of individuals to receive educational opportunities. Elder Clark G. Gilbert recently said, if BYU Pathway in Africa was its own institution, it would be the third largest church school. In Brazzaville, in the Congo, one institute gathering has 1,500 students who come every week, and more than two-thirds of those students weren't members of the church. As you and I step back and take some time to reflect on the great efforts that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is making as an institution to reduce economic inequality, to reduce educational inequality, I hope that first we feel joy. We are a part of the church, the efforts we're making to sustain the church, to pay tithing. This is part of that educational effort. And I also wonder if there are things that we can do more. Are there ways that we can volunteer in these specific educational initiatives? Are there things that we can do within our own communities to reduce inequality? Again, as we reflect on the parallels between the time leading up to Christ's coming amongst the Nephites in our day, we can ask ourselves, how are we working to reduce inequality in the world? Now, this passage about the church breaking up amongst the Nephites also reminds me of something that we talked about way back in, I think it was the third class in this master class. If you remember, back in 1 Nephi chapter 2, Lehi spoke to Lemuel saying, Oh, that thou mightest be like unto this valley, firm and steadfast and immovable in keeping the commandments of the Lord. The phrase firm and steadfast and immovable appears only twice in Scripture. One is this statement from Lehi to Lemuel. And if you think about it, in Lehi's life, his whole heart longed for Lemuel to be firm, steadfast, and immovable. But he never was. Sometimes I think a parent's hopes aren't realized in the short term, but there's a long-term perspective. Let's look at the other time that that phrase occurs. In 35.6, we read, The church began to be broken up in all the land, save it were among a few of the Lamanites. 
They would not depart from it, for they were firm and steadfast and immovable. I like to think that Lehi's hopes for Lemuel were fulfilled just centuries later. In my mind's eye, I can see Lehi as a parent discouraged, thinking, things just aren't working out for my family. And now, centuries later, I wonder if Father Lehi was there in heaven, and he's watching. Tears are falling down his cheeks as he sees his descendants, and he realizes those hopes that he had for Lemuel are coming to pass now. To me, it's a reminder to keep the big picture. Things may not work out the way we want them to in the short run, but in the eternal scheme of things, as we're faithful, we can have confidence that Jesus Christ will wipe away all the tears from our eyes and that all things will be made right. Well, as 35 chapter 6 and 7 come to a close, it's easy to get discouraged. The chief judge is assassinated. The government completely falls apart. Prophets are murdered. The people are increasingly wicked. And you're thinking, man, a few years ago, every person was following God, and now it's just a big dumpster fire. What happened? It can be discouraging for us, especially as we think about how 3 Nephi parallels our time today. But I love what President Emily Bell Freeman said. Her comment was, as I read through 3 Nephi 5 and 6, the Spirit whispered to me, watch for what the righteous people are doing. As I started reading through and seeing what the righteous were doing, I thought to myself, if my family can do these things in these two chapters, we will remain believers until the end. Now, this isn't a complete list, but just consider a few things the righteous were doing, even in a very wicked world. They did forsake all their sins and their abominations and their whoredoms and they did serve God with all diligence, day and night. They were humble and penitent before God. They were firm, steadfast, and immovable, willing with all diligence to keep the commandments of the Lord. They did testify boldly of Christ's death and sufferings. They were visited by the power and Spirit of God. We also live in difficult times, but even in our challenges, as we stay close to the Lord, we can find peace. Let's hear from a member of our master class. My name is Christopher Patch, and I work as a diplomat at U.S. embassies and consulates around the world. In the year 2013, I felt prompted to take an assignment in the country of Iraq, which involved being separated from my family for a year. At the time, it was very difficult to reconcile this prompting. Why would the Spirit prompt me to leave my family for a year? Shortly after I arrived in Iraq in 2014, the ISIS invasion occurred, and I unexpectedly found myself living and working in a war zone. It was an extremely stressful and devastating experience, and it was the first time in my life when I really felt in true danger which only added to my confusion and questions about why the Spirit would prompt me to take this assignment. However, during that year, I learned some of the most important lessons that I have ever been taught in my life. I learned about the power of prayer, the importance of my role as a husband and father, and how the enabling power of the Savior's Atonement can bless my life. Even though it was an incredibly difficult time for me and my family, I wouldn't trade the experience because of what I learned and how I grew closer to the Spirit that year. Thank you for sharing that experience. There are many parallels between Third Nephi and our lives today. We face challenges with religious freedom, self-deception, inequality, and with wickedness. If we can parallel our lives with the righteous who lived in these times, we can have peace. As the second coming approaches, we can forsake our sins, be firm, steadfast, and immovable. We can humble ourselves and testify boldly of Jesus Christ. As a result, we, like them, will be visited by the power and Spirit of God.